Hello, welcome to tonight's lecture about the solutions to your practice exam on WebAssign. So you realize you still have until 11.59 at night to finish this, but we'll be going over the solutions. And hopefully this will help, especially for those of you who are still having trouble accessing WebAssign. The first problem is to determine whether or not the statement is true or false. If the derivative of is the derivative of f plus g f prime plus g prime. This is true, it's just the sum rule. The second problem is to determine if f and g are differentiable is the derivative of f times g f prime times g prime. This is false. And it's false because the derivative of a product obeys the product rule, and the derivative of a product is not the same as the product of the derivatives. The third problem is to ask, is f and g are differentiable? Is the derivative of f composed of with g of x, f prime of g of x times g prime? You've seen this in lecture and in practice. Yes, this is the chain rule, and this is indeed correct. The derivative of a composite function is the derivative of the outside function evaluated at the inside function times the derivative of the inside function. Determine whether or not the statement is true or false. The derivative of the square root of f of x is f prime over 2 times square root of f of x. This is true. It's actually just the chain rule, but here the outside function is the square root function. If you recall, the derivative of the square root function is 1 over 2 times the square root function. And here you just apply it to f of x, 1 over 2 times square root of f of x, times the derivative of the inside function, which is f prime of x. That's true. Determine whether the statement is true or false. If y is e squared, y prime is 2e. Now this is false. This is a trick question because e squared is just a number. e is a number, so it's squ square is also just a number. And it does not... It does not, the power rule does not apply here because E is constant. The power rule would apply if E was replaced with X, was a bunk, was, in, was a variable. E is not a variable, it's a constant. This asks you the derivative of 10 to the X, X times 10 to the X minus 1. This is not true. Why is it not true? Well, it's not true because 10 to the X is an exponential function not a power function. So we can't differentiate it the same way we would differentiate a power function. The x doesn't come down, we don't subtract 1 from x. The derivative of this actually is ln of 10 times 10 to the x. Don't think you have to worry about that too much, but you do need to know that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Determine whether a statement is true or false. If g is x to the 6, then this limit, g of x minus 2, over g of x minus g of 2 over x minus 2 is 192. This is true. Recall this limit is the limit of the difference quotient, so its value is going to be the derivative of g evaluated at x equal to 2. So if you recall from the very beginning, right, f prime of a is equal to the limit x goes to a, or in this case g prime of a, equals limit x goes to a of g of x minus g of a over x minus a. That means that, in this case, this the limit of this difference quotient is going to be 6 times x to the fifth, which is equal to 6 times 2, in parentheses, to the fifth power. So this is indeed true. Trace or copy the graph of a given function. Then use the method of this example to sketch the graph of f prime below. So here, if you notice, the original, this is the original function. This function is in blue. You're asked to sketch the graph of f prime. What do we know about derivatives? If the function's increasing, the derivative is positive. So whatever the derivative looks like, when x is less than 0, f prime has to be positive. Now, when x is larger than 0, x f prime has to be negative because f, the function, is decreasing. 
So that eliminates this first choice here. And it also eliminates this choice because in both these choices, in the first choice here, f prime is negative, where it should be positive. Here, it is positive, but it's also positive where it should be negative. So that leaves these two choices, this one and this one. So this, it turn, now let's see. This one is not correct. Why is this one not correct? This one is not correct because, so you can see, okay, the function does indeed, f prime should be positive and change from being positive to be negative. But let's look at this, what happens to the slope. The slope here is steep. It becomes less steep, levels off to zero. Okay, so that's okay. So the this could have been the correct, this could have been correct if it was only the portion before x being less than zero that we were considering. But we're not considering just x being less than zero, we're considering x being larger than zero. When x is larger than zero, what happens to the slope? It starts off negative, it gets more negative, so it becomes steeper, reaches a, a sort of minimum, and then becomes less steep. It's less steep, so that means f, f prime should be going to zero, right? The tangent line here has smaller and smaller slope. Now here, as you can see, okay, so this, f prime isn't having smaller and smaller, is it going to zero, becoming more and more negative steadily. That's why this answer choice is correct. f prime is negative, negative, becoming more negative, hits a minimum negative value, and then goes back up to zero. So this answer choice is correct because of, you have to pay attention very carefully to what the slope is doing. Number nine. Trace or copy the graph of the function f. Assume axes have equal scales. Then use the method of this example to sketch f prime below it. So before we even go over this, let's see what f prime should look like. No matter what, f prime should be positive when x is less than zero and negative, again, when x is larger than zero. So let's see, can we eliminate any of it? Okay, so all these four graphs have that property. We also know at this top peak, this hill, f prime, the slope of the tangent line, is going to be zero. And what else do we know? Well, f prime, let's look at this slope. Slope goes from being kind of close to zero to being a kind of big positive value, and then goes back to zero. Then goes back down to being a minimum negative value, and then goes back to zero. So, it, so whatever, whatever f prime looks like, it should go from something close to zero to some to a top of a hill, back down to zero, then back down to tip of valley, and then back up to zero. So this isn't going to work. This is well, this definitely isn't going to work because here f prime is positive when x is larger than zero. So that's definitely going to throw away. Um, here, the second choice, f prime is positive, but it doesn't really look like it reaches the peak, right? It started actually as a very high number. Well, no, f prime doesn't start out high, it starts out low. Same thing here, it doesn't start out high, it starts out low. This is correct. f prime starts out low, reaches the peak, goes back to zero, goes down to the bottom of the valley, and then goes back up to zero. Trace or copy the graph of the function f. Use the method of this example to sketch f prime below it. Here is the upper half of a semicircle. Let's look at what f prime is doing. Let's look at the slope. At the top here, you notice it's the top of a hill, so f prime should be zero. If you look at the steep, right, if you're trying to climb up this graph as, as a, like a mountain, that's, that's actually almost vertical. And you're going up here, now it becomes less and less steep until you reach the top, then becomes more and more steep, and is actually vertical here. So what we expect here is f prime to go from something very, very high and positive all the way to zero, 
and then back down to something very low and negative. So this first answer we can automatically throw away because f prime is not negative when x is less than zero. It's positive. This answer, okay, this answer, this is a little tricky here. So this answer, well, this is almost right. So yes, f prime does indeed, but here's the problem. When x goes to whatever this value is, f prime is blasting up. It has a vertical asymptote. f prime blasts off when x is toward this value. This is not blasting up. It does, it's going it's positive, reaches zero negative. So this is a decent choice, but the problem is it doesn't share that asymptote. This we can definitely throw away, again, because f prime is not negative when x is less than zero, it's positive. And this is the correct answer. f prime has an asymptote, it's a huge, huge slope, goes down to zero, and then becomes very, very negative. Number 11, trace or copy the graph of the given function f. Then use this method of the example to sketch the graph of f prime below it. So here, what do we notice? This, this is a graph of lines. So lines, what do we know about lines? They have constant slope. That's very important. Lines have constant slope. The dirt of here, therefore, is going to be negative, constant, a negative constant, a positive constant, negative constant, positive constant again. This, this has the right idea because constant, 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 but it starts out as a positive constant. We want it to start out as a negative constant. Remember when you graph a constant function, that's just a straight line. This is correct. Negative constant, positive constant, negative constant, positive constant. This is incorrect. It starts at a positive constant, ends at a negative constant. There's way more variations than just those two. So number three, this is the correct answer. Trace or copy the graph of the given function f. Assume that axes have equal scales. Then use the method of this example to sketch the graph of f prime below it. So here, same thing. What's going on? f prime starts, it starts negative, ends up being positive. So this actually allows to eliminate. So notice again, when x is less than zero, f prime is f f prime should be negative. When x is larger than zero, f prime should, should, I'm sorry, when x is less than this positive number, f prime should be negative. When, f prime, when x is larger than this positive number, f prime should be positive. What does this mean? This means This means that f prime should start out being negative and stay negative until we hit a positive number. This we can actually throw away. f prime here, it's positive when x is less than zero. No, f prime does not become positive until we hit a positive number. Here again, x, f prime is positive when x is less than zero. And even here, so just from that, we can throw away these three choices, we end up with this choice. Now let's check why this indeed is right. Well, if you notice, negative slope down to hitting zero. This is kind of called a saddle point because it's neither a local max nor local min, but f prime is zero. So it goes from being very negative slope to being a zero slope. Then very negative slope again, reaches zero again. And a very negative, not so negative, so reaches zero and then becomes positive. This is a correct answer, right? Negative hits zero, that's at the saddle point. Back down to negative, hits its peak minimum value, that corresponds to that value around zero here. And then f prime goes up to zero, that corresponds to this little valley here, and where f prime changes from being negative to being positive. Remember, a valley or local minimum occurs when f prime changes from negative to positive 
or equivalently when f changes from decreasing to increasing. If you walk down towards the bottom of the valley, your height changes from decreasing to increasing. You walk down and then walk back up. Number 13. Our function is x to the fourth plus four times x. Find f prime. Well, this is just the power rule, 4x cubed plus 4. And it's right there. Pretty easy. And then let's just check our graph. So notice x to the fourth plus 4x. Check to see that your answer by comparing graphs of f and f prime. Okay, so what do we expect f to look like? Notice when x is less than, when x is very large, this function is looking like x to the fourth. x to the fourth, even power. If you recall from the beginning of the semester, we went over this a lot of times at the beginning of the semester. The function changes from decreasing, goes back to increasing. So it hits positive infinity when x is large and negative, and also positive infinity when x is large, positive. So let's see. So what, what could f and 4x cubed, this is an odd power, odd powers, when x is negative, they go to minus infinity. When x is positive, they go to pause infinity. So this can't be right. This is okay for f, but it's not okay for the blue f prime because x cubed, it blasts off to minus infinity, not pause infinity for negative x values. Same thing here. f is okay, but f prime, that's a problem. f prime does not blast off to infinity at negative, at when x is blasting off to minus infinity, when x is blasting off to pause infinity. This is correct. F's okay, like we said. F prime goes from minus infinity, goes back to zero, it's positive. You notice F prime, the blue curve, looks like X cubed, an odd power. F looks like an even power. Here, F looks like an even power, but it's flipped over, and that's because the coefficient of X to the fourth, it's positive, not negative. Here, this would have been correct if F of X was, say, negative, for x to the fourth plus 4x, but it's not. It's positive x to the fourth plus 4x. Let's go on to number 14. The graph of f is given, state the numbers at which f is not differentiable. What does it mean for f to not be differentiable? Well, we just need to see, you can't get a slope there. Notice here, it changes in nine is four. What's the pro, well, okay, so here it has a constant slope. Okay, so it's differentiable there. When x is, let's see, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, there's an abrupt change. It's a corner here. It changes from being a positive slope to being a negative slope. There's no way the function's going to be differentiable there. Then we go, okay, we're riding along this function like a roller coaster. Hit here. Well, what happens here? The function jumps from being a negative value to being a positive value. And it turns out a function, if a function's differentiable, it's also continuous. And this, this is not con even continuous at x equal to 0. So there's no way it's going to be differentiable. Even though maybe you can sort of see, okay, the slopes are kind of approximately equal. Well, not quite anyway. But the fun if the function's either jumping or if there's a corner, they're not going to be differentiable. The, function, the graph of the function has to look smooth if your function's going to be differentiable. Number 15. Now we are approximately halfway through the exam. The figure shows the graph of f, f prime, and f double prime identify each curve. How do we do this? Well, notice whatever. So let's. We need to. I mean, this is going to require some educated guesswork. But let's say we chose say b as our f. If b was our f. Then, let's see, what could be, then A could definitely not be F prime. And, um, let's see, C could be F prime, though. Let's say we chose B as our F. C, this blue curve, could be F prime because, yes, it's positive. Hit zero here, positive reaches a peak, hit zero where this has a hill. And then, okay, yeah, it's minimum, and then goes back to zero where it's even out. Yes, okay, so C is indeed the derivative of the graph. The C curve is the derivative of the B curve. That's true, that's actually true. But if this was true, now now look, 
what is the C curve doing when X is less than this, some negative value? It's increasing. Is A positive when X is less than this value? No, A is negative. So A, there's no way that A can be the derivative of B. So therefore, it has to be, well, maybe let's check. Let's maybe now A should be our function. So we have, we have that down. B is a function. C is its derivative. So, and A is not the derivative of C. So that means the only thing left for B to be is F prime. C, therefore, is F double prime, and A is F. Now we can check this. Well, what happens with A? It's increasing until you hit this value. And that's reflected in the B curve. Increase a positive, positive, hits a maximum. Slope increasing until you hit this value. Then you reach a little local maximum here. It's very subtle. But you do reach a local maximum, and that's where B curve hits zero. And then A starts to taper off, decreasing at a very, very slow rate. So decreasing a negative number that's very small. And you can see here, what's well, B? It's a negative number that's very small, right? Negative values that are very close to the x-axis. Number 16. Find equations of the tangent line and normal line to the curve at a given point. Okay, I will try to avoid questions. I realize we haven't gone over normal lines, so this might have been a little bit unfair, but I will try to avoid those in, in tomorrow's actual exam. There will also be fewer questions, so that should uh, be helpful in terms of that. The tangent line is x to the fourth plus 7 e to the x. So it's the, the tangent line at x 0 and 7, we differentiate it. 4x cubed plus 7 e to the x. Plug in x equal to 0. What do we get? 0 plus 7. Slope is 7. Has to pass through 7, so we get y minus 7 equals 7x, 7 parentheses x minus 0. Point slope formula. Y, solve for y, 7x plus 7. This, all this is the same thing. It's just the slope is going to be the negative reciprocal of the slope of the tangent line. The reciprocal of 7, or 7 over 1, is negative 1 over 7, and then it has to pass to the same point. So it's 0 comma 7. You can see y is equal to negative 1 over x plus 7 passes through the same point. Okay. Again, don't worry too much about the normal line. Worry about the tangent line. If it does accidentally appear on the, I'll, I'll make sure, I'll make sure that does not appear on tomorrow's exam. Show that the curve 3x cubed plus 8x minus 9 has no tangent line with slope 5. If y is 3x cubed plus 8x minus 9, m is y prime. So what is that? Well, okay, it's just 9x squared plus 8. Is this positive? Okay, so this, this is positive. x squared is always larger than equal to 0 for x, so m is larger than equal to 8. How can we ever have m being equal to 5? And it's always larger than 5, so it's not possible. That's what they say here. So there is a solution. y is equal to 3x cubed. Its derivative is 9x squared plus 8. m is larger than equal to 8. So there's no way a number larger than 8 is going to be equal to 5. Number 18. Our job is to find the value of c such that the line y is equal to 1 fourth x plus 1 is tangent to the curve c times square root of x. What do we do here? Well, let's differentiate c squared of x. We get 1 over c, 1 over 2c squared of x. We want this to be tangent, so we want that to be equal to... So what do we want here? We want the slope of the tangent line to be equal to 1 fourth. So that means we want 1 over c, 1 over 2c, times square root of x to be equal to 1 fourth. If we square both sides, we get 1 over 4 c squared times x to be equal to 1 fourth. That means 1 over c squared times x is going to be equal to 1 over c squared times x is going to be equal to One. One over c squared times x equals one. 
solve for solve for x. So that means that so the goal here really we need to solve for x and for c. What values of c does this work and what what x values are going to be? So 1 over c squared times 1 over parentheses c squared times x squared equals 1. That means that means c squared times x squared is equal to 1. Just uh, take the reciprocal both sides. So c squared times x squared equals 1. I'm sorry, c squared times x equals 1. So that means that x is equal to 1 over c squared. And so wherever this occurs, it's going to occur when x is equal to 1 over c squared. We know that. We can figure that out. Now, why does it occur when x c is equal to 1? Well, this, this passes through, so x is going to be equal to 1 over c squared. Let's plug in 1 over c squared in here. What happens when we plug in 1 over c squared to 1 fourth x plus 1? We get 1 over 4 c squared plus 1. What happens when we plug in 1 over c squared in here? We get we get we get 1. So when we plug in so when when we plug in 1 over c squared here to this value, right? We get c times square root. Square root of 1 over c squared is just c, provided c is positive. And c times 1 over c is going to be 1. So that means that That means that y, y should be equal to 1, x should be equal to 0. So, all right, I feel like there's a small error right there. Because um, the point is here that If this line, 1 fourth x plus 1, is tangent to this curve, that means the slope, 1 fourth, has to be equal to the derivative of this function at some x value. And at that x value, the value of the function should give the same, the same value as 1 fourth times x plus 1. So we do differentiate this, we get, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we get, okay, that's my mistake. It was, okay, we get c over 2 times, you differentiate this, you get c over 2 times square root of x. Square both sides, you get c over 4 times x. If c over 4 times x is equal to 4, that means c over x is equal to 1. So wherever this occurs, this has to occur when c, when x is equal to c, right? If c over x is equal to 1, or equivalently, c over 4x is equal to 1 fourth, then c has to be equal to x. So we're saying, okay, this, tan this, this occurs when x is equal to c. What happens when you plug in here? You get y is equal to c times square root of c. When you plug in c here, you get 1 fourth c plus 1. And... 1 fourth c plus 1, let's see, so, because if we plug in x, c is equal to 1, we should get 5 fourths versus, c times square root of c, which is c to the, alright, that's a little, um, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll come back to it. All right. Find the equation of the tangent line of the given curve at a specified point. If y is 5x over x plus 4 at the point 1, 1, well, when you differentiate this, so again, same procedure here, differentiate this, 5x over x plus 4. 
When you differentiate, you get 5 times x plus 4, parentheses x plus 4, minus x plus 4 times 5 over x plus 4 squared. Plug in 1, which you should get is 4 bits. And then, of course, when you plug in 1, what we get, we get 5 over 5, which is 1. See, when you plug in x equal to 1 here, you get 5 over 5, which is 1. Okay, next problem, number 20. If p of x is f of x times g of x, and q of x is capital F of x times capital G of x, where capital F and capital G are functions whose graphs are shown, find p prime of 2. Okay, well, p prime of 2, this is just the product rule. It's going to be f prime of 2 times g of 2 plus f prime of 2 times g prime of 2. What is f of 2? f of 2, we can look at the graph here. It's 1, 2, 3. We're multiplying 3 by what's the derivative now? of g. What's g prime of 2? The slope here we can calculate to be the rise over the run, 1, 2, divided by 1, 2, 3, 4. 2 over 4 is 1 half. So that means f of 2 times g prime of 2 is 3 halves. Now what is f prime of 2 times g of 2? g of 2 is 2, we can see here from the graph. f prime of 2, the slope here, we have bottom of valley, that is 0. So f prime of 2 is equal to 0. 0 times anything is 0. So we're left with 3 halves. q prime of 7, that's going to be f prime of 2 times g of 2 minus f of 2 times g prime of 2 all over g of 2 squared. Well, let's see, what is g of 2? 1, g of 2 is 2. 1, 2, so it's squared is 4. So this denominator, whatever it's going to be, it's going to be 4. Now, what's f prime of 2? We saw before, f prime of 2 is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we're not, I'm sorry, we're not doing that, we're doing f prime of 7, g, q prime of 7. So it's 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, that's good. So g of 7 is just 1. 1 squared is 1, so the denominator is going to be 1. Now, what's f prime of 7, it is, here it's the, let's see, it is the rise over the run. So here, f went 1, 2, 3, 4 units over, and 1 unit up. So f prime of 7 is 1 fourth. 1 fourth times what's g of 1, or g of 7, c of 7 is 1. So 1 fourth minus now what is g of 7, I'm sorry, what is g prime of 7, times f of 7. f of 7 is all up here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's 1 fourth minus 5 times g prime. 1 fourth times minus, let's see, so what's the dirt up here? The, the g goes over 1, 2, 3 units over, and 2 units down, from 2 down to 1. So it's negative 3 halves. So it is 1 fourth minus negative 3 halves times 5. So it's 1 fourth minus negative, three, negative 15, negative 15 halves or plus 15 halves. And when you do that, uh, the arithmetic, you should come up with 43 twelfths. Find the equation of the tangent line to the curve at a given point. So this is just a matter of differentiating. Differentiate this, we get derivative of sine 3x. This might look a little, so it's not, it's just not that complicated here because when you differentiate sine 3x, we get of outside function is cosine, cosine of 3x times 3, 3 times cosine of 3x, plug in x equal to 0, we get 3. We differentiate this, outside function here now is squaring, 2 comes down, 2 times sine of 3x, now times 
What's well, sort of sine of 3x we found was cosine of 3x times 3. But when you plug in x equal to 0 here, sine of 0 is 0. So 0 times anything is 0. It doesn't matter what cosine of 3x is here for this second term. So we get 0. Therefore, the derivative of this function at x equal to 0 is 3. Its value at 0, of course, is 0. Sine of 0 is 0. Sine squared of 0 is also 0. So point slope formula, y minus 0 equals 3 parentheses x minus 0. Distribute that to 3. We get y is equal to 3x. Second problem. Our function is square root of 4 plus 3 half of x. Here, f of 4 is 4, and f prime of 4 is 3. Find h prime of 4. f of 4 is 4, f prime of 4 is 3. Okay, so here, this is just a matter of using the chain rule. Outside function is square root. Derivative of a square root is 1, to, 1 half times 1 over 2 square root. So it's 1 over 2 square root times the derivative of the inside function. 1 over 2, 4 plus 3 of f of x, times 3 f prime of x. That's the derivative of the inside function. We're given f of 4 is 4. Well, what does that mean? That means that 4 plus 3 times 4, 4 plus 12 is 16. Square root of 16, of course, is 4. 1 over 2 times square root of 6, 4 is 8. That's why we have an 8 here. What's the derivative of the function? It's 3. 3 times 3 is 9. That's why we have 9 upstairs. 9 eighths. Number 23. Use logarithmic differentiation to find the derivative of the function. So here, take ln of both sides. We get y prime, we get ln of y is equal to 2x times ln of tangent. Now we just differentiate. Well, what's the derivative of y? ln of y, it's y prime over y. What's the derivative of 2x times tangent of x? Well, derivative of 2x, right, is minus 2 over x squared. That's where this term is coming from. You really should distribute this 2 over x, and it, what we should get is 2 over x times 2 over x squared times ln of tangent of x. That's what this second term is. It's minus 2 over x ln of tangent of x. Now, what's the derivative of ln of tangent of x? Secant squared of x over tangent of x. This is just the same. When you use trig identities, you get the same thing. This really should have just said secant squared of x over tangent of x. Well, you divide by tangent of x. Tangent of x is sine of x over cosine of x. Secant squared. Secant, secant squared. So sine over cosine. You flip things. You get secant squared, and then it's cosine times secant squared. That's just secant, because secant is 1 over cosine. Co cos cosecant is 1 over sine. So this is 1 over, it's really just saying 1 over sine times 1 over cosine. That's what you get if you replace secant squared with 1 over cosine squared and divide it by sine squared, sine over cosine. That's all. It's just that arithmetic. So... If your answer was instead, say, secant squared over tangent of x for this term, that'd be perfectly acceptable. Number 24. Find the equation of the tangent line for the curve at a given point. y is x squared minus 3x plus 1. The derivative is 2x minus 3. You plug in x equal to 0. When x is 0, You differentiate this, you get 2x minus 3 over x squared minus 3x plus 1. Plug in x equal to 3. What's 2 times 3? It's 6. 6 minus 3 is 3. 3 over x squared minus 3x plus. Okay, I'll end up. So, so we're left with 3. 6 minus 3 is 3. 3 over, well, now as you plug in 3 here, 9 minus 9 is 0. 0 plus 1. 1, ln of 1 is 0. ln of 1 is, I'm sorry, 1 is just 1. So we're left with 3 over 1, that's just 3. And then y minus, what happens when you plug in 3 here, we get ln of 1, which is 0. So it's y minus 
y minus zero equals three parentheses x minus three. Distribute three, we get three x minus nine. Here, use linear approximation to estimate this a given number, e to the minus 0 0.001. Okay, so here, what? how do we use different differentials or linear approximation? F of, remember the formula, f of a is approximately f prime of a times x minus a plus f of a. Here, x is negative 0 0.001. a is zero because what's close to minus 0 0.001? Or equivalently, minus 0 0.001 is close to which number? Closest to a, a number that where we can easily evaluate e to that number. It's close to zero, e to the zero, or any number that zero power is one. So a is going to be zero. And derivative of f, if f x is e to the x, it's derivative of this itself. So e to the zero is just going to be zero. Is e to the zero is just going to be one. And we're going to be left with what are we going to be left with? We're going to be left with one. Right? f prime of a is zero, f prime of a is one, f of a is one, so it's gonna be one times x, which is negative point zero zero one minus zero, one times negative point zero zero one plus one. That's exactly what this is, negative point point nine nine. And you can actually see, right? Well, what is the tangent line? That's how the number e was defined. The slope of f of x is equal to e to the x at x equal to zero, the slope of the graph of the function y is equal to f, y is equal to e to the x at x equal to zero is one. So in a linear approximation here, L of x is x plus one. Well, when you plug in negative 0 0.01 to x plus one, you get 0.99. Here's a nice problem. Explain the difference between an absolute max and absolute min. So this actually pretty much comes straight from slides I had up. A function has an absolute max at x equal to c. f of c is the smallest value on the entire domain, local minimum when x is near sleep. That's the difference. The only difference between absolute and local, absolute means on entire domain, whereas local means near. And that's the answer. We don't forward these other answers. Number 27. All right, we're getting there. We're almost done with this practice practice exam. Sketch the graph of function that is continuous on 1 to 5 and has the given properties. Absolute max at 5, absolute min at 2, local max at 3, local minima at 2 and 4. So let's see. Well, notice here, that's a local max at 2 and a local max of four. So we're gonna throw away this, exam this, this, this example. Again, local max of two, well, global max of four. Okay, here we have a local max, local min at two, good. Local min at four, but it's actually a global min at four. Well, we have a global min here, or absolute min at two, and absolute max at five, so. Absolute max here, highest value. Absolute min at two. Local max at three, local, top of the hill, bottom of valley at four. So local minima, two and four, those are bottoms of valleys. Local maximum at three, top of the hill. Now notice five, even though it's a local maximum, it's not the top, I mean, it's the top of the hill that doesn't, that, where you really can't go say any further and go back down, kind of like climbing to the top of uh, uh, the top of a cliff, where uh, when you overlook a cliff, okay, there's no way of right, walking back down. Number 28, use the graph of f over the given interval to find the following. The open interval on which f is increasing. And enter your answers using interval notation. Enter your answer. Well, it just look in the graph here. Here, remember, we're given f. We're trying to find the intervals when f is increasing. Now, it's important to remember here, f is defined only in this interval from 0 to 7. 
The open intervals on which f is increasing. It's increasing from 0 to 1. Where else is it increasing? Well, down here it's decreasing from 1 to, let's see, where is that? 1, 2, 3. And now it's increasing again from 3 to 7. There's your answer. Where is it decreasing? We just saw 1 to 3. Where is it concave up? Now we have to be careful here. That's where the function looks like a smiley face. Where is concave up? It's facing down here from 0 to 1. It's facing up from 1 to, where does it stop facing up? Here. And where is that? What x value does that correspond to? 1 is here. 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's concave up from, I'm sorry, it's, it doesn't start at 1. It starts at 2. Because where does it stop facing down? It's facing down here. Here, even at the hill, right? It's still facing down. It doesn't stop facing down until we get to 2. Stops facing down when x is 2, and it and starts facing up. It ends facing up when x is equal to 4. So it's concave up from 2 to 4. Faces down now from 4 to 5, and faces up again from 5 to 7. 2 to 4 and 5 to 7 are the two intervals where the function is concave upward. We just saw the intervals where f is concave downward. Well, from 0 to 2. Facing downward, that's this hill, 0 to 2 facing downwards, and now from 2, 2 to 4 it's facing upwards, and now from 4 to 5 it's facing downwards, from 5 to 7 it's facing upwards again. It's important here you don't write infinity because, or negative infinity here, because the function's only defined, as they say at the beginning, on the interval from 0 to 7. It's not defined at 0, it's not defined at 7, it's not defined for any number less than 0 or any number less than larger than 7. Now, coordinates of points in inflection. Recall that points in inflection mean x values for which the function changes its concavity. The function changes concavity when it changes from concave down to concave up or vice versa. Well, look, it changes from facing down on 0 to 2 to facing up from 2 to 4. x equal to 2 is an inflection point. When x is 2, what is the corresponding point in the graph? 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. There we go. There's our smaller x value. Now, what's the next point of inflection? It is 4. Changes from concave down from 2. It's concave up from 2 to 4. Concave down from 4 to 5. So, what happens when x is equal to 4? 1, 2, 3, 4. y value is 1, 2, 3. Sorry about that. It's 1, 2, 3, 4. y value is 1, 2. Two okay, it's almost at it's almost at it's almost at three, so that's why it's two point eight. Now, granted, this is a little hard to see at the, in, in the interval. So, if you mark off for saying two point nine or something, please don't worry about that. If an issue like that does happen in the exam, please email me. I will correct that because that's really unfair, especially since they didn't mark anything between uh, two point one two between two and three. So. The larger x value now, okay, so this, this you should be able to figure out the y value here because at 5 it changes from concave. What happens at 5? Here's 4, here's 5. It changes from concave down to concave up. When x is equal to 5, 1, 2, 3, here's 5. y is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, comma 4 is the point of inflection. Remember, when we say point of inflection, that means the point which is given in an ordered pair x coordinate comma y coordinate. 2 comma 2, x value, y value. x value 4, y value 2.8. x value 5, y value 4. 29. Two more problems and we're done. Suppose you are given a formula for a function f. How to determine where f is increasing or decreasing? 
Okay, so this should be pretty much straight off from, right off from my slides. How did, well, if f prime is positive, it's increasing. f prime is negative, it's decreasing. f double prime positive, it's concave up. f double prime negative, concave down. How do you locate points in inflection? Any value where x concave does not change, we have a point of inflection. Any value of x where concavity changes, we have a point of inflection. So here, remember inflection points are where concavity cha changes. F prime means critical points, not points of inflection. Changing from increasing to decreasing, no, that's gonna be local max or local min. Any value of x where function changes, from, no, that's again, local max or local min. Increasing decreasing is local max, decreasing to increasing is local min. Just think of climbing up a hill or walking down the first valley. The graph of the first derivative of f prime is a, a graph of the first derivative of f prime of a function f is shown. Assume the function is defined only for 0 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 9. Well, now remember here, what are we given? We're given the graph of f prime, not f. So when we say when f is increasing, let's translate that to f prime. That means where is f prime positive? f prime is positive when x is between 2 and 4. It's also positive when f, x is between 6 and 9. 2 and 4, 2 comma 4, 6 comma 9, those two intervals. At what x value does f have a local maximum? That means where does f prime change from positive to negative? f prime changes from positive to negative where? At 4. So remember, it, this does not mean where does f prime have a local maximum, in which case that right answer would have been 3, not 4. Here, f has a local maximum x equal to 4 because f prime changes from positive to negative there. If f prime changes from positive to negative, that means that f, the original function, changes from increasing to decreasing. At what values of x does f have a local minimum? That means, when we translate that back to f prime, where does f prime change from negative to positive? It's negative here, changes to positive here. That's at x equal to 2. 2. It's negative here, changes the positive here. Where does that occur? At x equal to 6, right? That's the number between 5 and 7 is 6. On what intervals is f concave upward? Enter your answer using interval notation. It is concave upward when f prime is increasing. Where is f prime increasing? From 1 to 3? From 5 to 7? and from 6 to 9. 1 to 3, 5 to 7, 8 to 9. Sorry, that was an 8, not a 7. Uh, not a 7, so 8 to 9. On what intervals is f concave downward? 0 to 1, 3 to 5, 7 to 8. So all the complementary intervals, 0 to 1, f prime is net decreasing. 3 to 5, f prime is decreasing. 7 to 8, f prime is decreasing. What x coordinates are the points of inflection? Well, let's look at this. Well, where does f prime have a local max or local min? Or equivalently, where does f prime change from negative to positive or vice, I'm sorry, from decreasing to increasing or vice versa? 1, 3, 5, 7, and 8. One, three, five, seven, eight. There you go. All right, that's it. Best wishes for the exam tomorrow.